so much better doing these face to face again, isn't it? Yeah, it's just it really feels less awkward like this. Yeah, the conversation just just it just it just flows. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Jake, I want to talk about color spaces. Why are you making the font so small? <laughs> Do you know, so, OK, when we were doing the lockdown stuff, the, the, your episode on GZIP, mm -hmm. someone in the comments pointed out that mm -hmm. my contribution to that episode was occasionally going, hmm, <laughs> this is interesting. <laughs> And you decide you will now... Please tell me more information, Sam. <laughs> you will now hate on my slides because you want to make more contributions than just that. <laughs> this is all I've got. No, well, in that episode, I, like, because it was on a teleprompter, I was really struggling to see the slides. So, like, I, I could hear it sounded interesting, and I let you know that. <laughs> But I didn't really know what was going on until I watched the edit. So I was oh. like, well, in the studio, we've got a, a screen with the slides. So I'm going to be able to, it's Surma's going to do episodes and I'm going to have meaningful contribution because I'm going to be able to see it. I Tiny. You know what? I'm going to blame you. Oh, uh, Because this is a new slide template because last minute changes. No, that's true. It was bigger before. Yeah, okay. I could have fixed it, but I didn't. <laughs> CSS is hard. Color spaces. Color spaces. I'm flattering myself. We are not talking about all of color spaces because it is a huge topic mm. and it involves humans and their perceptions and that makes things inherently hard. Yep. We're going to talk about colors and spaces. Well, do you know what? The title sounds perfect. It does, but it might leap you on that we're talking about more things. We're going to talk one aspect which I found really interesting. I still don't understand this entire topic fully. Okay. I think it's hard. I'm not even sure I got this all, everything perfect, but you There's know some what? Some real expectations. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to channel my, my inner white dude and just make a video about it anyway. Uh, fine. So Go for it. Let's, hey. let's, let's do that. <laughs> so Jake, look at this. I know this one. Yeah? Red. It's red. Yep. If I told you that this is FF0000, would you believe me? I would believe you. It's not. It's this. Because the actual red red is this. And you can see, oh, that's that's actually more red. It did get more red. It did get more red. So yeah. the question, I guess, what, what, what this leads to is, what does FF0000 or 25500 actually mean? Like, it obviously means the reddest possible red, but... Mm by measured by whose abilities. It can't just mean the reddest possible red on the, the screen that you're using, because then that would mean everything looks different everywhere. And that would be awful. I mean, I don't think designers would like that. The answer, if you want, I, I feel like I've already lost you. No, I, I'm, well, I'm going back to my default mode of, this is interesting, Soma. Please tell me more information. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. <laughs> the answer is that sRGB tells us what these numbers mean. And that is a color space. It's that thing you select in Photoshop to make the pictures look correct. Well, the, the interesting thing is that sRGB is just one of many, many, many color spaces out there. And for historical reasons I probably don't fully understand is that that's the one that is pretty much guaranteed to be fully displayable everywhere. Every device that has colors can probably display all the colors in sRGB. And that's why most of the web is sRGB. If you define a color in CSS, these coordinates mean this is sRGB. And sRGB in itself defines which reds, which, which red is the red, which green is the green, and which blue is the blue, and what happens when you mix them, and so on and so forth. That's all defined in this sRGB color space. So the intention here is that FF00 or F00 on one screen is going to look like F00 on another screen if they're both using sRGB. And are calibrated, but yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. At least close ish to that value. Yes. Now, the question or the, the thought is that, you know, sRGB says, okay, the red is, for example, this wavelength of red, and the green is this wavelength, and you can mix those colors to create all the other colors. Mm -hmm. Now, when you have a screen, the screen might say, well, I don't actually have that exact red pixel that you're assuming I have. So I need to convert that mix of colors that you are giving me in sRGB into something that the pixels in my actual physical screen can 
put out. So how does that conversion work? And that's actually a bit complicated. And what, what happens here is CIE XYZ. And if that isn't a great name, I don't know what is. All right, I've literally never heard of that. So like, you know, there's, in these episodes, there's a little bit of you know, games of like, ooh, SIGP, <laughs> tell me more about that. I have literally never heard of CIE. And we are going to basically okay. derive CIE XYZ ourselves a little bit All right. today. Because what that is, it is the biggest, a very big color space that can point or that can describe every single color a human can perceive, the average human can perceive, can I should I say. Can I buy a TV with this on? <laughs> <laughs> is that possible? You will find out why not. OK. Is it um, probably because but it is, some of them would actually give me sunburn? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's more that it's more of a mathematical construct, and we'll talk about this. But it is the one that is used as the common denominator, more or less, between all other color spaces, because it can describe every possible color instead of having a conversion from sRGB to every single monitor out there, and for all the other color spaces to every single monitor elsewhere, we have one base color space, CIE XYZ. So we can convert from a color space to XYZ, and then from XYZ back to the device, and vice versa. And that's how color spaces work. But let's talk a bit about how they got there, because that's actually a really interesting story, I all think. All right. So I'm going to assume that we can all just accept the fact that light is an electromagnetic wave that our eyes can perceive. And depending on the wavelength, we see a different color. I'm not going to go any deeper into that, because I actually don't know it any deeper than that. But I think we all kind of know from school that you know some uh, uh, electromagnetic wave with 650 nanometers length will be red. red, or will appear red to us, at least, with our eyes. Other eyes. It's all perception. What, exactly. What, what it's is all, red? It's all in the brain. And it, don't think about that too much, because it gets difficult. Got you. But this is kind of how we think about light and the colors that we see when those waves are around. All now, right. we have known for a long time that we have three cones, perceptors, in our eyes. Red, green, blue. Actually, no, but yes. Like, not at all with those. Actually, I don't think we have a proper red perceptor. But we have three different cones in our eyes that react to different wavelengths differently. And that kind of lets you assume that, hey, we can see all these colors, even though we only have three cones. Maybe in the inverse, we can create the same stimulation of any given wavelength with just a combination of three base wavelengths, because that's kind of how it seems our eyes would work. OK. It's not red, green, blue. What is it, what is it then? I'm actually not talking about that, but you can look it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> I'll <to> it. <laughs> OK. Uh, <laughs> Will you carry on? So they did in the 30s. Oh, you don't, not now? All right, no, sorry, no, sorry. Later. OK, later, later, later. I'll link to it. You can, link, right, you can read the link in the description once this is out on YouTube. All right, all right. Come on then. So they did an experiment in the 30s. And what they did is they put a, a wavelength on one side, and they had three individual wavelengths on the other side, and asked humans to manipulate the intensities of these three left side bulbs to match the color on the right hand side. OK. And with that, they could basically map out that every single wavelength could be emulated by those three basic colors the primaries, as they're called. And this is the graph that came out of that experience. It was a very long and tedious process, and lots of humans participated. And so this is the CIE experiment and created the CIE RGB color space. Now, if you look at this, or if any astute observer looks at, look at, at this, it goes like, what does a negative intensity actually mean? Because you can turn the light off, or you can turn it on. But what does negative mean? Yeah, I've never seen one of those lights before. Can so, I buy one? <laughs> so on the x-axis, we have the, the wavelength of the color on the right-hand side. And then we have the three curves on how intense you have to turn up that individual light to match the color. Mm. It turns out that certain wavelengths, there was no configuration of these lights to get the exact same color. They could only do that once they added light to the target. Oh. And that, and if you think about mathematically, like we have some red and some plus some green plus some blue equal that wavelength. Sometimes they actually needed to add red to the target value, which is the same as subtracting it from the other side. Of course, which of is course. how 
these negative values came to be. So what this, close this is get. actually quite interesting. So it means that doesn't actually contradict the original statement. You can there's still the idea that you can create all perceivable colors with just three primary colors, just not those specific three. Right. So there were colors that just couldn't be emulated, but the, that doesn't necessarily defeat the original idea. So what they now basically did, they took this diagram and they put it into a 3D diagram. We have to go 3D for a second. Uh -oh. Bear with me. Right. Brace but for impact. So oh. what, you, what you see here is we have each of these colors of our lights on one axis. And then for each wavelength that was matched by a human, we put a point in 3D space. And we get this really nice curve. And you can see that, for example, it goes into the negative red, red axis quite a bit, which is also what we've seen on the graph. And what they said, well, this is actually helpful because even though with these three primary colors, we can create all possible colors, we can now just use math. We know math. Math is good. Right. We can figure, use this to figure out which colors could actually create all possible colors that we can perceive, which three primaries. And they did. And that's x, y, z. Now, there's a couple of interesting things about x, y, z. A, it's a purely mathematical construct. They used the data from the experiment to create three new colors that mix into every possible color. They also arranged in such a way that the y-axis is pure luminance. So going up and down the y-axis only makes things brighter or less bright. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other fun fact is that x, y, and z are imaginary colors. They are colors that don't actually exist or don't map to any real known wavelength. So is lab color the, the a kind of a close Real. We're going to talk about that right. near the end. This is why I don't like. No, no it's, it's a really good point. So <laughs> it's, yeah, it, it really confused because we now have three colors that we can mix to get all human colors, every possible color we can possibly perceive, but these individual colors don't exist. And that's right. why I mean it's useful as a conversion space to go from sRGB to whatever your display can, can do, because both of these are by necessity real. But temporarily, in a pure mathematical sense, going into imaginary colors is fine, because we're going back to real colors afterwards. So that's, it's not useful as a real device color space. And that's why you can't buy a TV that can do x, y, z, because the primary colors don't exist. Well, well there, there we go. No new <laughs> TV for me. The second observation is now that this is about matching a specific light intent, like a specific light being shown on a screen, as it was happening in this experiment. Mm -hmm. But actually, we don't care about intensity. We only care about chromaticity, the actual color. So what really is interesting is the ratio between the colors. If you keep the ratio, like two parts red, one part green, the same, just in different amounts, it just gets brighter. But the color stays the same. And so we're like, oh, it actually means we can remove one dimension from here, because mathematically speaking, that is equivalent to projecting on a triangle. That doesn't really matter. So, so when you say brightness here, we're talking more about intensity, intensity right? In exactly. the way that like, pink isn't a brighter red, like, just because no, it's like, more it's white. It's a specific it's, chromaticity, but you can make it a really yeah. bright red that burns your retinas, or a really dark red glimmering in the distance. But it's the same color, right. just a different intensity. Okay. So what they did is they basically removed the intensity dimension from this diagram. And now brace yourself. All right. This is what comes out. It looks and like someone that, stood on it. <laughs> but that's something is. that probably many people have seen before. Yes. Because this is the very famous XY chromaticity diagram. <laughs> I should say that again. No. <laughs> the XY chromaticity diagram, All right. which is always used when we talk about color spaces, how much color they can represent, and at the same time, how much color they cannot represent. So the idea is SIGB. P3, Rec 2020 can all fit inside this. That's exactly what I want to talk about next. So if okay. we talk the original experiment that had these three colors, R, G, and B, these coincidentally red, green, and blue colors, had this R here and form a triangle. And because the way this experiment was done, we know that this is an additive space. So if we take two points in this diagram and we add the coordinates, what comes out is the color that also happens when you add those things together as light. Right. So that's quite handy. That also means that if you have these three primary colors, these three points, every color that you can mix in the real world with those as lights are inside this triangle. 
And now you can also see why we had to go negative with red, because there's a whole bunch of colors outside this triangle. Mm. So you can see that the, 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 the shape, the, out, the, the curvature on the outside has all the, the wavelengths on it. So the 520 nanometers is like a turquoise, and it's way up there and can't, couldn't actually be matched by this CIE RGB triangle without going negative red, I guess. Hmm. So that kind of explains to an extent why we went negative on, on that curve and how this is reflected here. Now, the other question is, of course, sRGB. We use sRGB pretty much everywhere. How big is it? It is very small. Not much smaller. That's... Well, one thing, actually, that's a good point. It's important to note that this diagram is not linear with human perception. What might seem a big distance in here might look very like very close colors to us physically or the other way around. Towards just, the edges, it's larger than it looks. And it's just because two points are close doesn't mean that they will look like similar colors to us. This, has, this diagram has almost nothing to do with human perception. Hmm. It's just about mixing colors. All right, so we have sRGB here. And now basically the XYZ color space is just used for this conversion. It's a purely mathematical construct. And what I found really interesting after learning about this, it can actually find the coordinates of each point of the triangle, for example, on Wikipedia. They're right there. There's the x and y coordinate for red, green, and blue, and the y point, which I'm not going to talk about today. But And then it's in the xyz color space rather than sRGB. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's okay. in the xy, and then you can convert from the, the 2D xy back to the full 3D xyz. There's a whole. A lot of math going on because again, it's all a purely mathematical construct. Okay. But now we have a new CSS spec coming up, or oh, not coming up. It's actually been around for a while, which is the CSS color four spec, and it also contains these. In this case, it's for sRGB. But what is interesting about this color, this this spec is, is that it also adds other color spaces. So we have always done colors pretty much like this in CSS, either with RGB or the hexadecimal notation. Yep. And um, but now there's a new syntax. Which is, this is pretty much equivalent. We're saying, OK, this is a color. The color is an sRGB, and we want to go full red. So we're going more to the WebGL model of, of using floats between exactly. two and one. Right. But now the, the, the interesting, exciting part is that explicitly mentioning a color space opens up the possibility of using other color spaces, like Display P3, which actually has been supported in Safari for a while if you have a monitor like a MacBook. Yep. That can display P3. And something that's newer is the so-called Rec 2020 color space, which is even more colors. And I'm not sure if there is support for this anywhere just yet. Um, but yeah, that is exciting. Rec or, 2020 is what, like, that when people refer to HDR TVs, yes. that tends to be Rec 20. Exactly. 20. It, it yeah. was an HD TV standard or something. So maybe people don't realize how big the difference is. So I'm, I try to make a visualization. So is this is like when you're trying to like show the difference between HD and SD on an SD TV. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I right, I, yes, I, I took this from our colleague Adam, who did like nice gradients. And on the right hand side is a gradient in Display P3. On the left hand side is sRGB. Now, because we're all watching this as a video on YouTube, and everybody has probably just sRGB monitors at home, and even if they if it can do more, the web probably can't as mm. of yet. So what I did is I basically shrunk the P3 gamut down to the sRGB gamut and applied the same transformation to the sRGB side. So we're seeing the, the same. The, 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 the difference between the two remained the same. Yes. Obviously, okay. the right hand side is currently just sRGB because yeah. that is all we have to work with. But you can see how much more color we are gaining when we go from sRGB to display P3. And that is really interesting to see that we, we've been missing out on so many colors for so long. I, I had screens for a long time which supported this stuff, which we, yeah. and we just can't do it on the, on on the, the web, web well until recently. So these three triangles, the innermost one is sRGB. Yep. The middle one is P3. The outer one is Rec 2020. So to that extent, again, like you can't say because it's twice the distance, it's twice as much color, but roughly as a Got, as, as a rule of thumb, I guess, the way sRGB pales in comparison to P3 
I reckon P3 will pale in comparison to Rec 2020. That's quite a lot of color. Yes, and that's why Rec 2020 tends to need more than eight bits per channel. That is the other problem, which I'm also not going to talk about today, is bit depth, which is often perceived as orthogonal, but actually is quite related to this. And it's also part of the reason why sRGB was used for so long, because it works surprisingly well for just eight bits. Yep. Uh, now, lastly, I want to just touch on something that is interpolation in color spaces. Because if you, for example, go from red to green in a gradient, the naive way and the way CSS does it is to just you know, decrease the red value and increase the red value linearly from your start point to your end point. Yeah, so red goes from 255 down to 0, green goes from 0 to 255. And it looks like this. Yep. And you know, if you don't think about it, it's kind of fine. But if you actually look at it, you're like, wait, why isn't the gradient, why is it kind of lopsided towards green? And why is it kind of dipping to a muddy gray? Sort of baby poo color in the middle. Yeah, yeah. That, that doesn't seem right. And the, the, the reason this happens is that human perception is not linear while light is in well, It depends on where your perspective is, I guess what I'm saying. sRGB has a so-called power function, which is probably better known as gamma, gamma correction, mm. um, which is both modeled after how um, CRT monitors worked back in the day, which have a nonlinear response to the electron beam hitting the glass, but also quite important because we humans are much better in seeing differences in low intensity light regions, darker regions, than the same difference in high intensity brighter regions. So having more bits for the details in dark areas is better than wasting them on high brightness areas. So we can remove that gamma correction, and then we are in a space called linear sRGB, which is sRGB without that gamma correction. And then we can do the same interpolation again, and it looks like this. And actually looks much nicer. Feels more natural. It feels like it's going to the intermediate colors that you would expect. But if you think about it, if you really look at it, you're like, wait, we're going away from red really quickly. Mm, and it, it feels, feels like you're green like, for a while. Yeah, it stays a lot, lot of green is there. It feels like it's getting brighter. It's not a consistent brightness. Because what this does, we have removed the gamma correction here. So this means, mathematically speaking, the light intensity is consistent from left to right. At every point in this gradient, the light intensity is the same. Mm. But we humans perceive different colors differently. So while it is, in terms of physics, it is actually consistent intensity, to us it doesn't feel like it is. Which is why a green always looks brighter than a blue. Exactly. Yeah. And this is now where, as you mentioned earlier, other color spaces like LAB come in. Mm. Because their goal is not to, not to model how physical light sources add up and what we get in the end, but what humans perceive. And so LAB is one of them. And there, they have pretty much nothing to do anymore with XYZ and the triangle and just points in there. They take a completely different approach. But because XYZ is the common denominator, most of these human modeling color spaces still give you formulas how to convert from and to XYZ. So XYZ really is the, the most fundamental color space that we use to convert from anything to anything, and that's why it's so meaningful. The universal language of color space. Pretty much. Right. And so if we interpolate a color to, between two colors in LAB, isn't that pleasant? Right, so it's taking the, we don't get the baby poo middle <laughs> section, no. but it is a feels like a consistent brightness throughout. And we have a fair amount of green, a fair amount of red. It's still not perfect, because humans are different, and everyone, and it's hard, I think, to figure out how a brain perceives a color. Mm -hmm. But I found it interesting, because I never really questioned that the gradient in sRGB looks bad until I saw linear. I was like, oh, linear is so much better. Well, I, I, I had always seen it as bad, but I just thought, well, that's, sorry, that's, that's the cost of going from two completely different colors. Pop, pop a different color in the middle if you want. It. And whenever <laughs> I do a gradient, like this, I put yellow. A, right. a brighter yellow manually in the middle yeah. or something like that as a, as a third stop. But yeah, you're right. Just going straight from red to green via lab seems pretty natural. And as well, this color space is also becoming available through that CSS spec. And so we will be able to, to actually just say, just interpolate between those, these two colors using this color space. And it will hopefully give us a lot more capabilities on making things look a lot nicer. So if you want to know more, here is a very tiny link to the spec. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Three, two, one. Three, two, one.
There we go. <laughs> now the audio can be in sync. <laughs> you know, we, we started doing that when, when we were on lockdown and we thought if we do three, two, one, clap, three, two, one, clap, then it's going to help the, the editors. It turns out like a year, a year and a half later, they're like, oh no, no, that doesn't help at all. We just enjoyed you doing it. <laughs>